Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, taking on various topics that tend to occur to visual storytellers when they embark on this endeavor of visual storytelling. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drost. I am a cartoonist and a teaching artist, and the other host is... Hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger, and I make video games, and I, and, and I teach about UX and creative process, and I coach as well professional coach. And so hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger. Robcoach.me. Yeah. Easy URL. Easy URL. And we, we should be saying it as often as possible. How are you doing? You know, fairly well. Um, there's uh, the the fun, the, I don't know, it's it, it's a gauntlet when you make a thing and, and push it into the world and you got a few things going in parallel. Like there's, like I said, I make, teach, and coach. Each of those is, are pillars uh, that I'm launching various things under <laughs> so yeah lots lots of happening in my uh in you know office times but uh but it's fun as well right the satisfaction of the making getting the right um position figuring out how to describe the stuff so it really reaches your audience um honing the material materials and all the messaging and marketing stuff it's mm -hmm. it's pretty fun but you know there's, there's an abundance of it right now. So <laughs> I feel good and tired. <laughs> I, I think of the old cliche, like, may you live in interesting times. You know, it's like, uh, I was, I was, uh, I was hanging out with a friend at some event and they were pointing out, um, uh, like some of the different organizers and facilitators at this event. And they were like, kind of speaking about it in this way of like, Oh, look at all the cool stuff that these people get to do and look at all like the the you know the connections between them. It just feels like such a like a really powerful, interesting in crowd. And I was like, all I heard was a bunch of people responsible for a lot of things. <laughs> you say cool in crowd, I say work, 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 work. Uh, but it's it's uh it, it's it's intellectually stimulating, that's for sure, to have to like be constantly changing gears that way and jumping from one you know, just before this Jenga tower falls, keep it back up and then go back to the other one as soon as you can kind of thing. No doubt. Like, yeah, you're, you're in the same sort of, um, mix of a, uh, professional circumstance, right. As far as, I mean, you're, you're making stuff and, and, um, like supporting events, all sorts of things, right? Yeah. I'm, well, cartoonist and teaching, cartoonist and teaching artist, which is to say I make comic books and I'm on deadline right now on a book that I, you know, hoped to have finished months ago, still working on it. Um, and then, simultaneously working as a teaching artist. So doing lots of comics workshops. I got one coming up tomorrow uh, at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. Uh, it's at three o'clock if you want to show up. It's for kids and teens. It's uh, how to make nonfiction comics. Um, and then next Thursday, I'm doing a program for the Cartoon Crossroads Columbus um, Festival, um, doing a Clip Studio paint demo. And then I'm doing events at CXC this year, and I'm helping develop the, pro the kids programming track at CXC. So, and, <laughs> you know, it's like I got that. Plus, I got a webcomic that I'm trying to keep going with my buddy, Dan Mishkin, so that we can hopefully get that out into the, you know, get an audience built for that. And uh, I'm trying to develop a pitch so that I can draw it over Inktober. And then, um, you know, hopefully at the end of October, have a deliverable um, product pitch to shop around to various publishers so yeah lots of different and, and all these things like oh and then there's this podcast that we do every week <laughs> so lots of different thinking processes and different approaches that are required in order to make all these things happen and so it's always interesting but there are times where it's like whoo do i get to be a person when do i get to be a person uh <laughs> yeah yeah that's you know we we choose to fill our time with this stuff and i suppose part of it is that it's um you know, you hopefully you're working toward, and then at the same time, there could be you know, like you you would ad adapt and, ad and adopt new things, like well, new tools, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes those become uh, like pillars of what you do, and well, and sometimes they're they're not, right? It's just like well, that helped me get from you know where I was to where I am now, and time to move on. That was a good segue. So yes, you've got to our topic. <laughs> <laughs> How many minutes did that take us? 
Five yeah. minutes took us, and we got to like actually the statement of topic. Well, anybody who's downloading the, and listening to the show or watching the video, no doubt knows what it's about. But yes, having all these different interests and different jobs to do means you're going to use a lot of different kinds of tools. And so we thought it'd be time to check in, see what some of the new tools we've been trying out in the first half of the show. Second half of the show, we'll talk about like what's our decision-making process? How do we recruit new tools to help us on all these endeavors? So with that, I should hit some music so that we can you know, know where to go next. Oh, right. Yeah. It's been a while. Like an episode or two. Yep, yep, yep. Hit those Dragon Balls. <laughs> okay. This means we're now in the first half of the show. We're actually talking about like what the thing looks like when we are engaging with it. So new tools. Who wants to go first? Me or you, Rob? You want to you wanna paper, rock, scissors? Or do you want to just go? Uh, I'm happy to jump in. Okay. Uh, so... There's a, it's so Adobe is a funny company, right? They've been around forever. Uh, they've really like, they've found a way to become the de facto tool in a market that I think now is changing. It's fine. There's, there's a time of like a lot of like stability of like the Adobe suite was mandatory and now it's almost mandatory. <laughs> it's, it's still really important solves a lot of interesting problems but then over time they like adobe's like branched out and created a bunch of other tools besides you know the the the, the linchpins of like what photoshop illustrator um indesign stuff like that um and they've got these sort of mobile and web-based tools they've been slowly getting out in the world and 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 i've dabbled with them right um and there's some that they've now moved under this umbrella called adobe spark Mm -hmm. and you can actually make a few different kinds of things with it. You can actually, you can make like a landing page, a web page. you can make a video, or you can do different kinds of graphics. Hmm. And it's heavily facilitated and template driven. So it's, I'm, as I'm looking at it, I logged in and made an account today uh, and lead up to the show. It, it's reminding me a little bit of Canva. Do you remember Canva? Uh, yeah, it rings a bell, but it's been a while. Was so Guy Kawasaki was like super into it a couple years ago. Um, let me go to let's see if I can do a search for it real quick and pull it up. Yeah, Canva online design made easy. That was like its big, uh, you know, uh, value proposition. Um, mm -hmm. And it was like very template driven. It was all done in the browser. And, you know, they had like stock photos you could use or you could import your own photos and you just like place text and move it around. And then you could export a, like a postcard or a web graphic. They had templates for Instagram posts, uh, Twitter banners and all sorts of things. Is that is that what Spark is essentially? Uh, very much so. Okay. So it's, it's uh, you have your sort of, um, well, different, you could be targeting uh, digital, you could be targeting print, um, and it's, it's, it, well, let's, let, should we do a quick demo? Sure. We're about right. to watch Rob use Adobe Spark. I imagine there's some advantages to it being in the Adobe ecosystem too. Like, oh, well, you can save it to your Adobe cloud account and then you can like take this and edit it further in Photoshop, Illustrator and, and whatnot. Uh, yes. I don't take advantage of all the different clouds though. Um, even though I, I could. There's just something about just knowing which cloud my stuff is in that, uh, you know, it's like I, there's, there's like what Metabang has a cloud. Adobe's got a cloud. Clip Studio Microsoft. has a cloud. Clip Studio. Yeah. Yep. A lot of clouds out there, Jersey. <laughs> it's not partly cloudy anymore. Could be scattered thunder showers. <laughs> All right. So let's say I want to make a graphic and I want to do an Insta post. Um, let's. Let's see. I'm feeling brutish. So I'm going to pick a moody template. It's got some. Um, so you see that it's, you know, doing its thing, grabbing the content, throwing it in the template. And it's pretty, pretty simple, right? Um, you grab any element and there's a few different doodads for rapidly iterating. And I found myself in, in a situation where I, I needed to rapidly, rapidly iterate toward making postcards. And uh, well, to support the coaching business that my wife and I are launching. And so let's say like I, I can jump to the style and play with the little style wheel, right? 
So this there's like a little wheel on the side. So there's a picture in the middle. There's a text box with a bounding box above it. And there's like the little like pop-ups of editing tools that, that one would see like normally, like even if you want to expand it, if you want to shrink it, if you want to change its color. But then there's this little wheel on the side, sort of like a uh, like the, something that you'd find on like a Wacom tablet. And as you spin that wheel, it's changing the fonts and colors of the text in the text box, but mm -hmm. it's changing different words to different colors and different fonts to create more emphasis on different words. Mm -hmm. So I, I went and I changed and I added a shape to the background of this. And now that's participating in this wheel thing. Mm. Right? It's, so it's like, it's like sort of like grabbing like a randomizer of best graphic design practices and dropping mm. it into this, this text box. Exactly. So interesting. Yeah. And then like, so I can, you can add more elements. Um, let's, let's add, uh, let's add an icon. And it's, so what, what are the, so this is searching the noun project. You ever use the noun project? I have. The noun project uh -huh. is great. Do you want to describe it? So, um, there's a, uh, okay. Icons. So really simple, the, the simple depiction of, um, persons, places, or things, right? That's, and this is a giant repository of, of where, where it's, it's trying to essentially be a marketplace. Um, in our era, everybody's making a marketplace. So if, you know, is there a, uh, a capability and, or an object and a market somewhere or, or and someone who needs it, someone's going to try to connect those two things and get a slice. Um, so I, for some reason, just, uh, thought this looks kind of like farm, like this, this background, um, Oh gosh, now that reminds me of the Mo Willems pigeon. Because, so like really, there's, yeah, that the pigeon should be saying New York Fashion Week. Um, and in fact, maybe this, uh, so this, okay, so the noun project, um, I got distracted with my playing with the creation. Um, but you get the idea of how rapid like you can, you can figure things out where I can, I can just click on a thing and replace it where, you know, now actually I think a, I think a duck speaks um, no, wait a minute. I just said, oh, well, I'm sorry. I said, should, should pick pigeon, pigeon. Um, let's say, okay. So there's fewer pigeons, but, uh, but there are some, uh, well, you keep playing. I'll describe what the noun project is the best of my ability. It, it's, right. it's a repository of iconographic images that you can use to in your designs and it's it's a pretty deep catalog of iconographic images when i say iconographic i mean like when you see like a restroom symbol um but it doesn't necessarily just have to be something as simple as that it could be like wayfinding symbols but like rob's playing with like different animal images first, first he had like looked like a, a side profile silhouette of a duck now it's like an icon iconographic bird's face so we're actually looking at the bird looking straight on at us but it's it's very simple vector shapes that you can use to um it, it, it to incorporate into your designs Mm -hmm. So there's this, and, and I'm mentioning yeah. it, it's it the the icons come from like hundreds and thousands of thousands of artists who make collections of icons. So if he's finding an aesthetic you like, you can probably get other things created in that same aesthetic and whatnot. It's a it's a really good repository, and uh, so let's say I want to change this to a farm because I, all of a sudden my my art art director said nope, we're switching up the whole thing. New York fashion, it. Um, we're thinking about, we're thinking and so about, now you're you're just like typing into a search box, and there's a sidebar full of I'm guessing stock photography that you are licensed to use within the within the within the app. Yeah, and so there's a couple of good sites for that that you don't have to use integrated in this tool. You can use uh, I don't know have, have you ever used Unsplash? No, that's one. Yeah, that's 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 a really good one. Um, and then I uh, uh, have not used Pixabay. So, but yeah, Unsplash is a great resource for sure. Um, there's, let's see. So I'm trying to find a, a appropriately uh, moodish farm. So like, uh, I'm going to say barn because I'm not getting the exact thing I wanted. So boom. A bunch right. of barn so owls just, pop up. Oh, and, yep. and a barn. Yep. Okay. So I've swapped out the image. Um, let's say. Uh, and all so you really had to do was just click on the image and then the bounty box appeared. And then the sidebar, you clicked on the barn and it just swapped out the image automatically. There's no dragging and dropping, no like opening a, a source file or anything like that. All right. So then I'm going to add some more text. 
Um, let's see. This is a little bit, sometimes a little wonky um, as far as the, uh, all right, there we go. Uh, let's see, no more slow prototyping. And then, and so it's a block of text in block, like a, a sans serif text that is like, it's automatically formatting it so that like whatever's in the first line is a certain size, whatever's in the middle line is a certain size, whatever's in the bottom line is a certain size. And as you type it, you don't have to think about formatting that, right? Like it just auto formats. All right. So I am totally about making some baloney right here. And I've got flexibility to um, resize. It has, so there's a lot of logic going on here. Like the, the spatial relationships among things as you resize are being there. That's, that's curated, how that changes. The, the idea that there are, um, there's the, the easy guidelines as far as, you know, knowing when, when things, where things are spaced re related to one another and whatnot. It's all pretty, it's really meant to, to move things really quickly for you. But now let's say, hey, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I, this, isn't, this isn't what I want. Or maybe it's what I want. But then, all right, so I'm just going to download a PDF of this and then keep going. Because I can edit that PDF in Illustrator. Oh, that is, it, it shows up as a layered PDF for Illustrator? Yeah, well, they're separate objects, right? It's it's not super organized well as as a okay, um, but still, they're they're editable yeah. separate objects. As that's uh -huh. that's great. So oh now, my gosh! And now you're just like clicking through different templates, and it's auto formatting all of your information. Wow! So I'm like, hey, now I'm getting somewhere that I like. So this is yeah, I'm, I'm liking this one. So now I I can iterate. I so I was working on um. So if I go back to my projects, you'll see some things I was working on. And I made about 30 versions of a postcard that, um, let's see, this is the one that Kate ended up picking. People are getting a sneak peek of that. Um, so this is like for, for, for leaving on, um, you know, tables of events where it makes sense to spread the word about our coaching or whatnot, or, or events that we would expo at. Right. And mm. uh, here's, yep. Yeah, here's, here's Kate's, where, where, where we landed, um, mm -hmm. you know, getting the appropriate message for her and, and her aspect of coaching, um, which is navigate the busy, focus on the important, create the best for your unique family, hire a coach, try a free discovery session, mycoachkate.com. Um, that's it. Get the message out. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was just cr cranking these things out and s sending her texts, uh, doing the collaborative process, pretty fast where it's like, oh yeah, we've got um, a lot of versions to have a lot of food for thought with different imagery that reinforces the messaging, new iterations on the messaging, all that stuff. So the idea of, well, what could have taken, like honestly, over a time span, a, a, maybe a week or two. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say like... Oh this is what I do with comic covers. Like I give like when I did the cover for rockets or the, the initial design, uh, I think it was like 22 designs. And that was like a, almost a whole day's work of sketching out all those different versions, even though they were really loose sketches. This is like, this is bananas. You could prototype like 20 versions of a thing in like what an hour. Oh yeah. It, it, how enriched are you starting the prototyping process? So one thing that, that was a great help for me is that, um, the iconography for our businesses and the, and the our, our color palette for our brand um, and our, our language was coming together already. So that was, um, let's see, I'm trying to find, where's, where did mine end up? Oh, um, so yeah, I think I might have accidentally written over my final one, <laughs> but thankfully I've saved the PDF of it. So um yeah, but anyway, you get the idea that uh, you can, yeah, you can try a lot really fast. And it just, it, and even if it's directionally getting you somewhere and not exactly getting you where, to, where you want to land, mm -hmm. um, because the original concept I had was I was going to make something that was um, like 
aspirational propaganda poster, Mike, right? <laughs> and yeah, uh, you know, that's kind of the art direction I made up. And and uh, I was going to turn the background into an illustration, but I might start with this this photo as the um, as the composition and even some of the subjects that I would I would change the subjects to be a little more uh, amplified reality and stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, this is uh, not my final one, but it's one of the you know thirty different things I tried. You know, I, I think about how um, there's a thing called the story cubes. Oh yeah, you know you know you're familiar with those, and like they're just like little like prompts that you can give yourself to like start beginning a story. Um, it feels like that. It's like design story cubes of like here you're adding like a, a slightly random element, like we're just randomizing it. Oh, there you go, got them right there. Yeah, so you can show us what they look like. So what is it? Is it how many dice we got here? Um, three, six, nine, nine dice. And, you know, each one of them has a lot of, well, it's a little bit like the noun project put on dice. Mm -hmm. You have various icons and, uh, you know, depicting a, just a variety of, of, of subjects. And of course, yeah, you shake some dice and roll it and see what, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Wow. And, and so it, it adds just enough of a random element just to like nudge you and help you begin to work within those those conf those parameters of those constraints, right? Um, yep. Keep moving. Get your creative process, you know, fed and rolling, so you can shape where you want and need it to go next. That's really cool. That so like when I first heard of Canva, I was like, I've got. I've got InDesign, I've got Photoshop. What would I need that for, right? I mean, yeah, I guess I could use it on a Chromebook. That's great. But like when you talk about it as like a way to do rapid prototyping, that is interesting. That is that's something that I feel like if if graphic designers don't know about it, they should um mm -hmm. and to use it in that way, right? Cuz it can't replace like, you know, real like, you know, idiosyncratic uh deep institutional knowledge kind of graphic design but it can certainly like propel one to like move forward really fast on something. So, yeah, I mean, you don't have to have a car with seat belts and windshields and all that stuff, but, uh, uh, it's it, so it's the thing with like, we had a whole episode about this where it's sort of like, what was it? Um, uh, yesterday's skill is, is tomorrow's app and. The oh, future. wow. That's a like deep that. dive. Yeah. Good memory. I'm, I'm misquoting it and it's fun to misquote yourself, but I don't know. Memories. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's, but the idea is that um, the, the space that we work within our communities, our collective knowledge and the tools we use, they keep, they keep evolving. And the, um, the way we got from point A to point B uh, should probably move as well. And in some way, right? Because I, even if I clarified an idea of what I don't want to do, it helps me move forward. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that's that's a pretty helpful point. And it depends, right? So this is this is the whole like creativity as a service kind of thing. And you you do want to find the utilities and efficiencies and stuff. But anyway, um, mm. you know. Like what, um, like uh, art for art's sake, art that expresses some deep, meaningful truth. Only how you can see it as a human being. You might use tools like this anyway as I, an ironic expression, but you probably won't, right? Um, right. I suppose. What could you do? You could probably set up multiple computers and then what? Dump a truckload of um, like like ball pit balls and see what comes out of it. That's art. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> what, what, uh, what about your tools, Jersey? Tell, uh, tell us about something. I knew this would be kind of a long one, uh, but there, there's no, it's good. Uh, so let's see, what are we going to talk about? Well, I've got, I think two or three on my list. Um, 
and one that you automatically well actually know that I think like part of the inspiration for this 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 topic for the episode um, was the watercolor pencils that I've been using. Um, let me pull up the website so I can show it on screen while I talk about it. But um, and so I have been last year I took a watercoloring class with my wife Anne and I really enjoyed it and I started using more watercolor in my sketches in art drops that I do and then I got to thinking that I'd like to do a comic in watercolor eventually and um, I don't know if you remember but ages ago this would be like two three years ago when I would do art drops on my bowling nights I would do a drawing and color it with crayon and I would mm-hmm. try to do and, and like it was more or less like trying to get good production value out of a cheap quote unquote throwaway product or, or art tool like a box of Crayolas and I every you know every fall I buy a couple boxes of crayons to you know because they go on sale for the school year and then I burn through them you know doing these little art drop sketches well Anne found out about these um I don't know you know how to say this it's reversed on the screen but I'll pull it up on um Oh, from, I see it uh, the correct way, though. Oh, do you? Oh, for the way it's being broadcast. To make sense for your, um, yeah. Yeah. Your but it's uh, Karan de Arc, I think, is how you say it. And what they are is they are literally crayons that when you, you color like as you would with crayons, um, and then when you put water on them, it it blends them like watercolor. So it's kind of, and they've, they've been watercolor colored pencils for a long time. Um, Prismacolor famously made some. But the thing that, so Anne got them for me because she's like, oh, it's kind of like the best of both worlds for you because you liked coloring with crayons and you like watercoloring now. So like you just color the image like you would with crayons and then just like dr- pull water over top of them and it blends them. There's there's pros and cons to it. Um, um, but the, a big pro is just how darn vibrant they are. I mean, they are... Uh, let me pull up. I've got my um, Instagram feed pulled up with um, some of the art drops I did at PowerCon not long ago, and you can you can see the difference very clearly. Um, so when you go back and look at some of the the PowerCon um, drawings that I did with traditional watercolor, they're 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 nice. They look they look fine, but then like the the brightness just changes dramatically when you start seeing the, the crayons one like this this trap jaw that I've got pulled up on the screen it's just it, the color is really rich um but i mean the the downside is is that uh the the way it blends i mean i guess it's just i just need to practice more with them i think is what it boils down to is once you lay down the color and you throw the water down it blends the color and it's really rich and bright. But if you go back in there with water, it is really easy to remove color more so than I found with other watercolors that I've tried. So you can lighten things more easily, which is great. But if you're not careful, you can inadvertently lighten things really rapidly. So I'm, I'm, it's, it's very different than painting a traditional watercolor in that way. Um, in that, like you're sort of just like, do you remember those like watercolor books that we had when we were kids with the paint with water books? You know, it'd be like, it's a Scooby-Doo drawing and there's all these little colored dots on him. You just run water over top of it. Now he's brown. Um, it, sometimes it feels a little bit like that. It feels less like painting to me because you're actually doing more of the values and shading at the crayon level and then just like sort of finishing it with water. So it's, I'm finding that I'm, I'm overworking the drawings more readily because I'm painting as if I were painting with regular watercolor where you're applying lots of different washes. So, but... um. I think it was like it was like twenty bucks for the starter pack, and this has what ten colors in it, um, and uh, what is it? It's like two dollars or some odd cents per color if you go to a place like Blick uh, to get them. So you can build your own collection if you want. Um, but uh, do you have to sharpen them, or how does that work? I mean, they look like they're here. Let me pull one up. Yeah, they're just like regular crayons. So yeah, I mean, you you could sharpen them, right? Um, yeah, just like with a regular pencil sharpener, um, but I mean, like, you know, or you could just do the thing where you just work them on their sides when you're when you're coloring to keep like a point on them. But uh, I haven't had the need to do like even with these little tiny Masters of the Universe paintings that I've been doing, um, I haven't had the need to do any like really fine detail work with it. Um, another thing that I'll do is I will take um, a little piece of paper and just like put like a couple you know, scribbles on it and then like water that and then bring it in. So like I'll sort of create like a side palette, which is not the way that uh, I don't think they're meant to be used. But anyway, um, 
I'm having a lot of fun with them, and they travel really well. Because I mean, they're in this little tin. It's really thin. It fits in my bag, and I can just with my water brushes and my pen, pencil case, I can take them virtually anywhere. And I do. I mean, they're in my everyday carry bag now. So should I have the need to do a quick watercolor, I could do it. Um, so yeah, they're they're more. They're let me let me put it this way. They travel better. So here's my watercolor tin that I carried around with me everywhere. Um, which I've talked about in the show before, right? It's just like a little, it's pretty small, you know, and it's got this cool little loop on the back so I can put my finger in it so it just stays in my hand while I'm painting. But you could see that there's like just enough of a difference in thickness that it makes an impact on my bag, right? Like when you're talking about your everyday carry bag, like that, it's like two, it's like half the width or the thickness, which when you, when you're, Counting for every centimeter square cubic centimeter of your bag that makes it you know that counts right you've you've made these these decisions in the past yes you're smiling like <laughs> you you know what I'm talking about oh yeah I mean for me it's I I tend to overstuff my pockets with that kind of stuff um, <laughs> I do a combination of it's like I've got my pocket carry and then my bag and you know the sometimes yeah the the bag just takes all pocket burden away but then. <laughs> Uh, I, I see the, both of those things and, and it, it reminded me when, when phones got bigger and you're, mm. you're dealing with that kind of thing. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, I remember when I got my first iPhone, which was like the iPhone 3G, and I remember the phone I had before that was a flip phone that when it folded up, it was like, you know, it was like a full, like, maybe two inches thick, which made it made an impact in your pocket. When I put that, that like little piece of glass in my pocket, the iPhone, I was, I was like, oh, it's so thin, you know, my life has changed forever. But for for me, I absolutely, I have like this total... Um, uh, allergy to putting things in my pockets. I just can't stand having stuff in my pocket. So I like to put everything I can in my bag if possible. Um, mm, okay. So and, my, and so, so like every square, like I said, cubic centimeter in my bag is like accounted for by something. And I'm trying to keep the bag as thin and light as possible so it's not a strain on my shoulders or my back, but also make sure that I have like everything I absolutely want to have when I'm in the field, as it were. Um, so yeah, we did an episode called Everyday Carry where I went through like what my bag setup is and it hasn't changed that much except for the fact that, you know, these guys, these crayons have replaced my watercolors for now while I experiment mm. with them, while I play with them because they may not be the final tool that I use because I still really do enjoy working with traditional watercolor. But uh, yeah. Yeah, Those they seem like like different aesthetics, honestly. So I mean, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's, would you ever use them both? I've thought about that. I I have thought about like possibly like if I need something to look extra intense and extra real or supernatural, maybe that's where these guys would be like really really useful, and then render everything else with traditional watercolor to make it seem more uh, tonally grounded. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, thought about it because. Um, I just haven't, like, this last two weeks, I haven't had time to really do much watercoloring at all, sadly. But that has crossed my mind because um, as I was, I, I, I was thinking about how much I missed these watercolors recently. So in this one, I had, this set I had optimized because I have, like, Ken got me this little tiny mechanical pencil. Um, it's like, Ooh, look at this little itty bitty thing. That's a and mechanical it's, pencil? This is a mechanical pencil and it's 0.5 millimeter and I got my blue lead in it so I could do my penciling with this little guy. And then if I really need to, you know, I've got a little, I took a brush and I cut the end off so I could uh, fit it in here too. So like this, this is like all I, this in a pad of Bristol and I'd be ready to go. Um, I keep looking for those kinds of, I, I get fascinated by those kinds of efficiencies. Can I get it? So I'm so lean that I can get everything into like this little shoulder bag and then I can go out into the zoo and do some animal drawings. Um, like there, I see ads in my Instagram feed for these like artist bags. I don't know if you've seen these where they have like a tripod on them. It's like, it looks like a shoulder bag, but then like you, the tripod just like drops out of the bottom and then opens up and it becomes like a, uh, an easel. what do you call it? An easel for you to draw on or paint on out in nature. And I'm like, that looks really cool, but that is so specific and it's kind of big and bulky and I couldn't use it just for other instances of like, you know, like going grocery shopping or anything like that. So, um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, sooner or later, I mean, it depends on the kind of, it depends on how well the contraptions pack down because you mm -hmm. may end up uh, being sort of an awkward one-man band where, you know, 
where if, yeah. if you're like uh, a one man creative info demo presentation teaching band where you like you got a shoulder mounted Pico projector, <laughs> um, you got your easel backpack, yeah. <laughs> shoulder bag full of all the drawing supplies and stuff. I, I am I am always like teetering on the edge of that. Like I'm walking right up to the edge and looking into the abyss of being one man one man teaching artist cartoonist uh, band. Um, walking around with, like just yeah this this toppling pile of things on me and I'm always trying to like okay whoop whoop up too far too far too far, like let something fall off and let's try to slim it down a little bit more, but um, but yeah yeah so and I, I'm I, this is also partially idiosyncratic to me in that I'm trying to find more ways to not be in the studio all day like yesterday I intentionally went to down to campus so that I could just work all afternoon at the Billy Ireland like they have spaces where you can just work. And so I was like, well, why not? Why not, you know, just get out of the house, um, take a bus and be around people a little bit, have some uh, ambient noise around you that you don't have control over. Um, experience like how, you know, other people work in the world. So, uh, and, and to do that, that means that I got to take my whole studio with me in some way or another. So, <sighs> yeah, it's a, it's a neat set of concerns. Um, as far as, yeah, what, what tools fit into that as, as well. Like, uh, I, I, I cared a lot more about working nomadically as soon, like right around when, uh, well, having my first kid. So mm. that was, that was a, that was a big deal. It's when I adopted a mod book so I could draw electronically. I forgot days. about your mod book. That's right. Yeah. That was, that was the old MacBook pro that was modified to act like a Cintiq. Um, I but wish unfortunately, it was that version it was it was the um the 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 white plastic MacBook. Oh, that's right. That was converted, and then they you know they talked about this other fancier version, but uh, no, I never never got that one. <laughs> but yeah, it was it's yeah thinking of the, like adopting the tools, and you also something came up uh, as you were describing your your different tools where you have the tools you miss, and you're like, oh. <laughs> that 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 one was so good at its job. Yeah, uh, I can't wait to to have that kind of job again, just to get to use that tool again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, very much so. Um, so yes, there, there's no, there's no. I mean, and there, I don't feel like I ever want there to be a ultimate solution, right? I I want I don't ever want there to be like, well, I'm done thinking about it. I want this thing to be an organic, living, breathing thing, and I'm constantly messing with the knobs on and changing out parts because um, that keeps it novel and fun for me. Um, are we at a good point to take a break and then maybe talk about how we decide what tools we're going to take on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, along that way, maybe we'll end up mentioning another tool or two, but yeah, we'll see. Quite but, possibly. Uh, how we navigate it. I, I like it. Okay, cool. So in about minute 30 seconds we're going to talk about like well how do you take on like how do you audition a new tool for a job what are the criteria that we think about and what's the decision making process look like for us but before we do that we have to thank some people who make this show possible those people happen to be the folks who support us on patreon patreon.com slash lean into art is the website what is it it is a crowdfunding thing, sort of like Kickstarter, sort of like uh, co.fi, but it's like a way for you to do like a monthly upvote of the show. If you believe in Rob and me and you believe in what we do, you can say, hey, here's as, you know, you contribute as little as a dollar a month. You can cancel any time. So you could do a one month contribution. Uh, you do like a three month contribution. You know, you, you d t uh, set the terms on this. But I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on a regular basis. First up, Stephen Stonebush. Thank you, Stephen, for leaving in us and what we do. You can, uh, oh, I don't have your your uh, Twitter handle, Stephen. So you just have to find Stephen on our uh, Patreon page, patreon.com slash leanwithbart. Thank you to Cameron Callahan. You can find Cameron on Twitter at Cam Callahan. Thank you, Cameron. And good to be curious. Thank you. Good to be curious. And their Twitter handle just happens to be their name. Good to be curious. And Brandon Dayton, fantastic illustrator, longtime friend of the show, been on the show multiple times. You can find him on Twitter at Brandon Dayton. And finally, Ashley Knapp. Thank you, Ashley, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Ashley on Twitter at Control Alt Lee. You can join them at patreon.com slash lean into art, where you will find all the posts we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for Patreon supporters once a month, and those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place with fellow leaners. Patreon.com slash leanintoart is the website. Thank you to everybody there. We, it, your support means a lot to us. Thank you so much.
Mm. Uh, so, oh, hey, I need music. We you. need music. We always need music, Rob. Some some tonal distinction to let us know that we are now in another part of the show. Okay, so what now? How do we choose? What what do we look for when choosing tools? So, um, when when you're shopping for a thing, um, what sort of things stand out for you? Like you you mentioned uh, so you mentioned actually a whole bunch of criteria as far as like your bag, and mm-hmm. and um, what what uh, like. I mean, commonly, I suppose you're, you think about what you're trying to accomplish and, mm-hmm. you know, the constraints you're surrounded by and the one, you know, the ones you've chosen, the ones that are incidental, just part of the situation. Um, what, um, um, so, yeah. So, yeah. So like Anne has a lot of very fussy, uh, art supplies. I call them fussy. She would call them nice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh but like here's like one of her one oh i shouldn't have done that i shouldn't have turned it because the watercolors fell out but this is one of her nicer watercolor palettes and she goes through and like labels all the colors in there and then it opens up and it's this really lovely big palette to use and very nice like high quality colors she also has um uh this watercolor set that she got last christmas i mean it's you know, really gorgeous, uh, super high quality colors. Um, and she has like a lot of like, yeah. what's that? Looks like a Pantone grid. It's like, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's like, and there's, I don't know if you can see, but there's luminescent colors in here. Like I, I'm itching to try these. I'm like, do they, are they as that shiny in real life? Like when you paint with them? Um, yeah. anyway, so she's got, she's got these tools that are really meant to be used in a studio, right? Like this, this is not meant to be like thrown in a bag and carry it out and around. Um, so like one of the criteria that I look for in with art tools specifically is, um, and, and I say this, I want to make sure that I, I preface this and, and contextualize it in this way. I used to be a person who in the art and story days, I remember saying this a lot, like I have to be at my desk to get my work done. I cannot draw out and about. It's, it's impossible. I need my art desk. I need my, T-square, I need my triangles, I need my rapidographs and my crow quills and my inkwell. That's the way I work. Big piece of Bristol. Um, that's changed. I am much more mobile now and I enjoy being much more mobile. And so one of the criteria that I look for in the way I work is it has to be lean, scrappy, it has to be durable, it has to travel well, and um, it can't be too big. Like this is just far too big to put in my everyday carry bag. Um, it's a lovely watercolor set, but it's too much. You know, I need like, well, how many colors are in this thing? All right. Uh, six, I got 12 colors and that's all I need because I can mix what I need. Right. As long as I have like, and there, there's certain like limitations that uh, come into play. Like when I got this set of these crayons, um, originally it only came with one green. There's like a, a kind of a, a base sort of what you'd call a forest green. And as I was painting, I was like, you know, I actually use like a yellow green a lot and I'm having trouble mixing the yellow green with these colors. So I actually went to Blick and replaced one of the colors with this yellow green that I use in a lot of my paintings. I I tend to use a lot of yellow green, and a lot of purple in my uh, watercolors. So that was like another thing I noticed is that like, okay, I'm going to have to modify the base unit (laughs) in some way. And as I went to the store, got the replacement color, dropped it in my, in my pack, that kind of thing. So um, it's it's contextual. It's based on how it's going to be used, right? Um, so, what I, did you what did you I hear in there? Try stuff. I, I this is. I mean, I'm hearing that a little bit from what you're describing too. Is that I try to get into a situation where I can uh, live with a tool, and thankfully, in the world of of sort of digital services and stuff, for the most part, that's pretty easy to get in the neighborhood of trying a thing or just trying literally different different apps and stuff. Um, mm. It, you know, some, and, and when I can't actually try it, I, you know, I'll try to, to go toward the, um, you know, the affordable end of the market. And if I, if I have to buy it, but I, I need to be really confident that I, that I need it. Like I, I actually bought, um, um, like when I was first starting to produce my, my latest round of, of, uh, downloadable workshops, 
I was rigging up my studio and I, I was, I was having a, I wasn't liking the quality of video where it's like, if, if I can see myself on my camera because I'm, I'm in, it's in selfie mode and I've, I've, you know, mounted my phone where, where it's, I'm filming myself with it. It's not the best. It's not the, it's not the best camera, right? That's right. lower resolution video. Um, it's, it might be fine for some uses, but when I'm doing, when I'm trying to hit that balance of uh, low budget, high quality, uh, is there something that would help me, you know, do that? So uh, where where I could still see myself or what have you, and use the back camera, uh, or yeah, I guess it's called the back camera. And so there was a there's a tool that I ended up just just buying, and it was you know through reading articles, reading uh, you know blog posts. Um, reviews, all that kind of stuff. It was, I thought, well, this, I have enough of a confidence signal. And I think it was like 30 bucks, which is a, it's a, you know, it's not the most expensive tool to buy, but if we, as far as apps go, that's a hefty price um, mm-hmm. for a mobile app. Oh, for sure it is. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So um, what's, what's it? It's a uh, Filmic Pro is what I ended up going with. And it's companion app, uh, Filmic Remote. And I think it's, it's both on uh, iOS and Android. Okay. So that was that was a nice signal. Also, I happen to be using mostly iOS as my platform, but uh, but it's nice to have options. And um, yeah, so it's it it ended up doing the job. But I had to sort of do enough to buy the thing to then try the thing because in the end, I need to try the thing before it's like, yep, this is an adopted tool. Uh, it's one of my that the, so trying stuff is my one of my biggest. Um, uh, techniques for adopting a tool, but then, com- you know, right alongside with that are spreadsheets. And I think about qualities I care about that uh, are s- distinct among the tools, like both features and benefits that matter to me. And uh, I will create spreadsheets to compare tools. Um, I could share a screen to give you a, some oh, idea. That'd be great. One of the, like, um, yeah. So jo- Joseph Coco is in the chat, and he's saying that I was hoping Rob would just say that he put a mirror behind the camera. <laughs> ah, ah, did you try that dang it if i would have podcasted about this before i have 30 more bucks in my pocket no. <laughs> um, the remote's pretty neat so i i have like an old device that i'm able to to sort of set near me and use as oh, oh uh, i can control things um and and get a preview so mm. um you know i can adjust the audio i can um um look at color Actually, balance that, and all sorts of stuff being able to do that while you're standing there in the light i think makes a big difference right because like if you had to keep going back around to the phone and like changing it there then go stand in front and then look at the mirror that'd be a lot of that'd be that'd be frustrating so yeah but honestly a really awesome idea though um so not to just rationalize my choice i i like the idea a lot um thank you joseph <laughs> uh so here's an example spreadsheet um, so this one represents a bunch of work thinking about the, the, uh, the flow of the user experience of our service that, that Kate and I are setting up. Um, well, and it is set up, but, um, this was, you know, a couple months ago, trying to choose among different tools that allow for the, the hosting and presentation of, of our, you know, our digital presence. And then, uh, what happens as far as, uh, when someone lands, in that presence and then what can they do next and different tools look and feel pretty different uh, i was thinking about i i could have created separate spreadsheets for these because there's there's not really apples to apples and all this but there's weird combos of of uh there are scheduling tools that work with different hosting tools extra in an in a in an improved integrated way right mm. so like uh i'm trying to think what acuity is owned by wordpress um, there's the WordPress calendar. No, no, sorry. It was owned by Squarespace and then, then WordPress integrates with the WP calendar plugin. And then, uh, no, Acuity, who has Acuity? So no, and then Square Appointments has nothing to do with Squarespace. That's the, the, um, the, the, uh, the payment point of sale app. Yeah. Yep. And the point of sale. So then there's schedule more and set more. Um, Zapier, which is this glue for integ- integrating these things where it's like, if I want to, you know, be logging sessions, can I do that automatically in some way who, what tools integrate all that stuff? So then 
the, I've got the tools on one side here. I've got the service flow as major categories across the, you know, our, our sort of the stages of, of interacting with us as a business. Um, so, you know, starting out from, um, you know, I didn't put, you know, marketing and, and learning about us, but then I started with landing page, onboarding, coaching, keep in touch, and a few additional features. But then under there, there's the actual features, right? Um, monthly costs, the payment transaction fee, can we book live calls, all sorts of things, right? The attributes that I care about grouped by phase of the relationship with the client. Um, so then uh -huh. it's capturing, <laughs> then capturing data as far as uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the details for all these, which basically becomes a question to ask yourself about this given tool, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, payment track and like who who am I set up and who do I like the service of working with as far as payment and where, what are my choices and, and so that all fed into eventually choosing a, a host which we, we chose Squarespace and we chose schedule once um, so you have Squarespace for the website schedule once for the um, logistics of um, uh, you know payment and calendar integration and and sign up for coaching services so that's Anyway, spreadsheets. Spreadsheets to capture your reflections on the, you know, the the differences between the different services and how what your experiences are with them, and even even like some like uh, quantitative stuff like like how much does it cost? How often is it billed? Right? What payments? Do, what services do they accept? Um, things like that too. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's, that's an interesting question to bring up because you could think about like with any art tool, uh, that I use, there's different prices, right? So like when it came to these crayons, um, you know, when, when Ann said, well, they're only like two bucks a piece. So if you wanted to replace one of the colors, well, that just like l lifted some friction on it. Cause like when I was looking at the, at first I was like, yeah, these are all good colors. Doesn't have the green that I use a lot of. Right. Well, if it was like seven dollars for a green crayon, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to. But like when it was like, oh, it's two dollars. OK, well, now I can move forward and, and, and play with this thing some more. Um, start to. That's uh, great because some things you'd pick, you get kind of locked in. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and um, or, or, or the cost for change can be just not palatable. So one of one of the tools that I didn't mention, which is this is a good time to mention it, um, is Affinity Publisher, which I recently started using, which is um, a sort of competitor to Adobe InDesign, and it's it's well crafted in that if you are very familiar with InDesign, there is a next to no learning curve. It's very easy to dive in and start playing with it, and and I found that it has very intuitive. Uh, idiosyncrasies in the way that it works like the way that you what you would normally use key commands for to adjust certain design elements they've created like sort of new knobs on the outside of the bounding box so like if you if you push on the bounding box it's going to change the bounding box but it's not going to change the size of the text but now there's like an extra dot you can grab onto on the outside of that to say well this will change the size of the bounding box and the text well normally i'd have to hold down the alt key to do that well you don't need to do that anymore now it's just like mouse clicks little things like that i think are really nice but it's fifty dollars it's fifty dollars, and like, yeah, it doesn't have like the cloud ecosystem that Adobe has, but they're working on it. And and I thought about my use case. I'm like, you know what? I don't need a big cloud ecosystem. I just need something to do pagination for the comics that I make for clients, and then something I can make flyers for the advocacy work that I do, like for CXC or A2CAF. Um, so, and, and then I didn't want to pay an ongoing subscription for anything. So like that was another thing where Affinity Publisher was like, well, one time fee, you know, and we're for uh, Windows and Mac. Okay, you flicked all the switches. I, I'm willing to give this a try. Um, and they had a trial that I could, that you could download and play with for a little bit. Um, and uh, did the trial, yeah. um, what was it like navigating the trial? It was a full version of the app. That Whoa. just like, yeah, like I, I think you could actually save stuff in it too. So you, I, you got the full experience playing with it. It was like a, I think it was like a beta. It wasn't the fully finished version. So like, I think the exchange was, as they said, look, you're going to let us, you're going to give us some feedback on the way this thing works. And you're going to, you know, give us, let, let us track some, uh, like if it crashes, you're going to send crash reports to us and so on. So we can collect, so we can perfect this thing a little bit more. In exchange, we'll let you use this thing for a few months for free. 
So, and then when the, when the the trial was up and they were like, well, now it's time to buy it. I was like, yeah, take my money. This is this is great. So, um, and I mean, you said thirty dollars feels like a lot for a uh, mobile app. Fifty dollars seems very cheap for a desktop app, in my ex- opinion. Um, so, especially in this age that we're entering, where I think more and more things are moving to a subscription based um, scenario. So, uh, but then I also tried out and Affinity Designer went out fast. Let's see what was the other one I tried. Uh, Scribus, Scribus 1.47, which is an open source. That one had like a few extra points in the initial starting gate because it's like, ooh, you're free, you're open source. I really like that. Um, but it was it didn't have quite the um, intuitive interface or rather intuitive I shouldn't say that it didn't have an interface that mapped so clearly onto oh you're an InDesign user here you go you know this looks a lot like what you're used to but with a few different things to it um, Scribus was just different enough that I was like mm, this is gonna take me a little bit of time I have to get this thing done now you know Affinity Designer wins right um, but. When I have more time, haha, uh, I I will happily sit down with Scribus and play with that some more too. Because another constraint that I'm putting on myself as I try out different tools is that free open source always better. Can I can I head more and more in that direction eventually? Hmm, that's cool. It is a great, it's a it's a it's a great world. Um, I, I remember very distinctly, and I mentioned this before, but like it. Uh, somewhere around what 2007 or eight uh in really getting into that the ubuntu ecosystem and um i've kept the hand on it since but but i it was like my full-time um, desktop for maybe a year and a half somewhere in there wow uh, yeah and it, it just feels very different it's a very uh it's it's almost weird it where whatever you, you know, go to the app store, go to the down, you know, just select software from here. Just take it. Go ahead. And it's like, I, really? Is this, is this, is this okay? It's okay. You know? And yeah, it's, it's, it's a neat space. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of trade-offs, different complications. And as far mm-hmm. as like, who, who do you need to serve and how do they integrate with that, that space of uh, free software? Yeah, and and a, a trade off for Affinity Publisher is that um, I it can't open uh, previously made InDesign files because that file format is proprietary to Adobe. So I am going to have to recreate some old stuff. Although I think you linked me to an article about how Scribus can actually interpret and open some old InDesign files if you have them. There's like a workaround for that. So there's points to Scribus now. Okay, so like if it comes to a situation where I have a document made in a design that would be a lot of work to recreate. Well, time to invest more in trying Scribus. Um, so yeah, um, in in a different category of why I try out new tools, there's also just um, joyfully leveling up in one's knowledge of a thing. Uh, so it's something you're already using, but can I learn? Can I learn a little bit of a more of what it can do kind of thing? Um, and this kind of, there's like, a, there's an urgency to this as well. So um, I'm actually leading a workshop next Thursday, uh, talk and teach Jersey Droz on moving from Photoshop to Clip Studio Paint at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. It's at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum in the Will Eisner Seminar Room, and it's free. And uh, I'm going to give an overview of using Clip Studio Paint to make comics aimed at the person who's used to Photoshop. Because like that's like the number one complaint I get. We're not complaint, but friction. That when I talk to people about, when they ask like, do you use CSP? I'm like, yeah, I've been using it for like five or six years. And they're like, I'm just so in the, the Adobe ecosystem. I just can't get out. I just know Photoshop so well. I've been using it for 20 years. I can't learn something new. I'm like, well, let's do a workshop where it's like, let's hold take you by the hand and show you how this isn't that different you know like show you the the things that are absolutely the same and then point you joyfully towards the things that are like very different um but uh knowing that i had this thing coming up i was like well i should probably like re-familiarize myself with clip studio you know the difference between those two right rob or no oh what clip studio versus what clip studio paint clip studio paint 
uh wait manga studio clip studio paint so so yeah so cl see clip studio they just they love to do this thing where they like can we come up with really confusing naming uh structures so clip studio paint is the drawing application itself clip studio is this thing they launched i want to say like a year maybe a year and a half ago um where it's it's their cloud service and it's like a it's like sort of a portal app that from which you can launch different uh, applications that the company makes. So paint is, you know, like there, I've got it up on the screen and like the, the top left tab is, um, it just says paint and that launches clip studio paint. But the main app itself is sort of like a cloud launching pad where it's like, you can pull up instances of past work that you've been working on. Here's like the last five things you were working on, but it also has, uh, an asset bank where like a marketplace where you can go and download and purchase different pens, different textures, different, um, what are called materials. So you can make 3D materials. I'm, I'm, let me go to the app and scroll through some of these. So um, here is a 3D model of a person playing a violin that you can import into your application and use as a reference image. And you can even you know, pose it uh, in different ways within Clip Studio Paint. But then there's just like image materials where it's like here's some you know, uh, photographs, um, here's some brushes. Um, Here's a snow material. You can just import some snow into your drawing. So a whole bunch of really cool um, assets and materials that you can like import into your Clip Studio Paint for use uh, in your drawings. And then um, through Clip Studio, you can sync all of your app settings so that if you have multiple instances of the application, so like I have, have CSP on two machines, I can just download all my um, app settings, it'll, uh, it'll load all of my brushes, all of my materials into that second computer without me having to do it all over again. So, um, but anyway, so like that, that required me taking a little bit of extra time this week to dig around clip studio and remind myself what it can do. And once I was there, I was like, Oh yeah, that's right. I can make, and I, and I did just to, to like, as a way to level up my skill, but also to be able to make a demo for this workshop I'm doing. Um, I made a snow brush. So it's a brush that when I scrub it across the screen, it randomly creates snow particles that I drew. So I drew all the snow particles, loaded them into the brush, we created the scattering effect, and now, you know, I can just go up, 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 and now it's snowing in the shot and it's on its own layer, right? Um, That's cool. Um, there's, uh, there's, I, I've seen uh, demo videos of, I mean, people, they, it's a, Clip Studio Paint is quite a, is, is quite a, um, a, a very deep, impressive tool that solves so many problems for visual storytellers, and especially if you're making comics. Um, um, that's yeah, it's uh, yeah. I know the edit, the videos are edited. It's almost like watching a you know a stunt in a movie. It's 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 not <laughs> really real, but like, uh, but aspects of it are and. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 neat like when someone's throwing a, a a model in to pose and they're using the the um the the perspective tools and and mm -hmm. just 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 throwing things in to solve problems really fast in a way it's like a, a having a more advanced uh let's see a more complex complex and advanced but but also rich uh environment compared to like the adobe spark right where mm -hmm. they're saying you don't have to solve all these particular problems on, on your own. We're not making it all solved at once by, by one big template, but there's many uh, specialized things that can complement each other that are all, all in this toolbox if you're willing to dig around. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all the tools, I see them as ways to help you execute your art faster. Um, and I, I was I was talking with a, a friend of mine who just learned about the um, there, there's a bunch of rulers that I'm gonna have to spotlight in this workshop, um, and there's one that's called the symmetry ruler, and this ruler exists in apps like MetaBang and um, uh, oh, what was that one that I was using in Android for the longest time? Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. What was it? Layer Auto Paint Desk. HD Sketch. Oh, sketch, yes, Autodesk Sketch has it too. But what it is is just a rule that you throw down, and when you draw whatever you draw over here, will get mirrored over there. And we, we, he was this friend of mine saw a video of somebody using that 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 ruler. He's like, "Wait a second, how does that work?" And I showed him, and he's like, "That's like cheating." And I'm like, "Well, <laughs> is it?" I'm not too. 
<laughs> we do an episode of that. Like, well, you know what? I have right here a flexible ruler, and this gets this flexible edge for drawing. Oh my gosh, that's like cheating, you know? <laughs> so it's like we could point to a zillion things that are like cheating. Uh, this this artist friend of mine also said, like, I know it's not cheating, I know, but it just feels like it. It feels like some kind of workaround and shortcut. Well, that's what that's what we do in cartooning. Um, one more thing, just to continue my little silly ad for the workshop. Um, I d had made a deal with Clip Studio Paint um, where anybody who attends my workshop will get a free three-month license to the software. Um, yeah, so, I mean, normally the, the license you get is for one month, and they were uh, good enough to acknowledge that um, that if you're busy and trying to work in addition to learning a new thing, you don't necessarily have uh, the bandwidth to fit all that training into one month. So it's a, it's a three month license that uh, I have enough to give away if, even if the room is filled. So um, it's next Thursday at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. Um, what was, the, I don't forget what time it was. <laughs> I'm gonna be there, what time is it? Oh, it's at 10 a.m. Talk and Teach, Jersey Drows the Movie from Photoshop to Clip Studio Paint, so. That sounds like um, a awesome workshop yeah well hopefully it will be <laughs> i mean i i will do my best so it'll probably be okay um i don't know any other criteria or we got stuff for final thought well i, I think um i think we're, we're sort of leaning uh, leading leaning toward a, a maybe a potential final thought of uh you describe going deeper with a tool right and mm -hmm. it's like it's almost like there's two kinds of jumps where you can say, "I'm going to, I'm I'm going to commit this this tool. I I need to find that that next level, or if there or like what what um when when do we find it worth making the jump? Either way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, the difference between jumping into a brand new thing versus leveling up an existing thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, so how about we do that in about two minutes? But first, we have to thank some other people who make this show possible. And those people uh, happen to be us. We make the show possible. We make things and we bring our thoughts in making these things to this show. Uh, and the thing that I make that I hope you will check out... Um, I'm not actually going to talk about any of my products today. I'm going to talk about a thing that I'm affiliated with, and that's Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, which is uh, at the weekend after this coming weekend. So what is that? It's the, t the 20... Actually, it starts on Wednesday. So it's like the 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th in Columbus, Ohio, uh, happening all over town, happening at the Billy Ireland, happening at the uh, College of Cre Columbus College of Art and Design, um, at the Columbus Metropolitan Library and the Columbus Museum of Art. And uh, I'm going to be doing two events there, three events. I'm going to be doing my uh, Clip Studio Paint Workshop and uh, as well as a drawing game show with cartoonist Rob Armstrong, Terry Liebenson, and Alexis uh, uh, Fajardo. And I'm going to be part of a science comics uh, workshop with Jason Viola, uh, all happening at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. Rob, you're going to be there. <laughs> I will be. Looking forward to it. Seems like a like an awesome event. Great community. Be fun to uh, to meet up in person and hang out. It's 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 an amazing comics festival, and it's it's cracked a, 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 an important problem that comics festivals traditionally have. In that the industry, I just saw this on Twitter today. Somebody said uh, comics has two worlds, and the way to find out which world a cartoonist lives in is ask them what who the big two are. Meaning, like, if you ask one person, they'll say, oh, it's Marvel and DC. And another person will say, oh, it's Scholastic and, you know, uh, I don't know like Macmillan or something, right? Um, and these, these, these worlds don't overlap a whole lot at comic shows. You either go to, like, your traditional superhero show or you go to, like, more of a indie show or, a, you know, a book published show. Cartoon Crossroads Columbus has all those worlds interacting in the same show floor, and it's magnificent because there's no hostility, there's no anxiety, everybody's just there to say, oh, this is all just comics and it's all wonderful. So, like, there's, like, kids programming happening all weekend, and then the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists are going to be there, the Nib is going to be there, Mike Mignola is going to be there, you know, it's it's all of the worlds colliding, and it's, it's, it's very, very joyful, and um, I've been going to the show every year since it started, and this will be their fifth year. Uh, and I'm a little bit more involved in it now that I'm living here. And so um, 
I helped develop their kids track of programming and I'm uh, hopeful that lots of people turn out for it. Uh, so it's cartooncrossroadscolumbus.com. Uh, Rob, how about we talk about the thing you made? Yeah, so this is uh, something that we mentioned a few times during the episode. There's uh, uh, coaching, uh, professional coaching. This is a service yeah. that uh, I'm offering and my wife is offering. And it's, I, I don't know how, how, if you've encountered this in the past, it's something that, you know, in some communities, you, it's, it's a familiar, obvious thing. It's like, oh, that's how people, you know, find ways to navigate their path and level up and go to somewhere else in their career or to, um, you know, get through their blocks to get that book into the world or whatever it is. But how I describe, uh, you know, my focus for coaching is that um, it, honestly, it's common for any of us to be too busy to listen to ourselves and, you know, to see all the opportunities in front of you and dig into the choices and to then move forward. So then I come in as a professional coach to help and invite you to do some introspection, prototyping and designing a way forward. That's the, uh, you know, so coaching is about moving forward then. Um, and I have a focus toward that sort of, um, you know, artist and, the software indie developer, all that kind of stuff, or even teams as well. So I'm happy to help out organizations um, who are who are looking to you know level up in their collaborative process and get more user centric as well. Whereas Kate um, is she can, can coach in any topic that I can coach on, but her background is is more about the the um, uh, helping couples who are entrepreneurial and uh, how do you. How do you make all that work where you're, you're, you're creating stuff, whether it's one of you or both of you and, uh, you know, making your business happen and your relationship happen at the, at the same time. And it's, you know, you're going, you're going to encounter various different kinds of blocks and stuff in that situation. And, and similar you know, benefits of coaching apply as far as finding, finding the blocks, finding ways forward. And uh, you can connect with Kate's coaching landing page through mycoachkate.com and my landing page is at robcoach.me we have a lot of people who listen to the show who are like part of a creative couple right and uh i have a feeling that a lot of them would benefit from approaching kate i i have talked with kate i have had private sessions with kate like informally like we were hanging out when i was uh visiting you in minneapolis and she has a very uh, disarmingly relaxed and thoughtful approach to getting to the heart of a problem. And this is just so imbued into who she is that we were on a walk and I was frustrated about something that was happening in my life that she was just sort of like just gently p poking at. And then suddenly I land on this sentence that summarized a assumption I had about myself that I didn't know I had about myself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was just, it was, it was almost like, you know, um, an episode of Growing Pains where like I turned to the camera and said the line of what the episode was about because Kate got me there, right? Just through gentle poking. Um, that's the trick. So it feels, so I've, I've seen coaching sessions go a variety of ways where um, that, that, that's a, that's an awesome reaction and, and that's a cool, um, cool example. And, but you were doing the work. That's the yeah. interesting thing about coaching is that yeah. uh, it's almost like adding this, this outboard brain, to help you with that navigation. And uh, the, the it's not about the uh, like prescribing and well, here's my five steps, here's this or that. It's really you where you're at. And if literally taking the time to skillfully navigate your own choices, you're going to, you're going to move forward and coaches help in that as opposed to telling you where to go. So you can find both of them at shieldsstenzinger.com, robcoach.me, and is it Coach Kate? My Coach Kate. My Coach Kate. All right. Uh, but the other thing that we hope you will check out is uh, we have a Discord now. We have a Discord server uh, where you can chat with other leaners, and the an invite link will be in the show notes for this episode. Um, there are two public channels. There's topic requ requests and comments. So you can request future episodes of Lean Heart. Like, this is the thing I'm struggling with. Could you guys, like, share how you approach it? Um, comments, you can comment on past episodes. Please mention which episode you're commenting on. Uh, but then there's also a Patreon section where 
people who support us, leaners who support us on Patreon can hang out in Castle Level Up, where you post uh, projects that you want to get some help from the Brain Trust on. Uh, Gentle Town is where you can ask for a high five. Look at the thing I made. Isn't it great? And then finally, Social, where you can just talk about, hey, here, these are the best burgers in town, and here's a picture of them. And uh, Rob and I are there, as well as a whole mess of other leaners. So uh, the page, uh, Lean Into Art Discord. So... And so how you get to the to the des- best level of the Discord is to go to patreon.com slash lean into art and become a patron. There you go. Okay, final thought time. Let's let's clear the decks and and say boom, that's a podcast. Um hmm. how do you determine whether to dive in versus leveling up an existing tool? What do you think about that? Well, I think it's a lot about the this intersection of, of need and trust for me, where it's like, I, I can have need where it's like, it, I, I have this feeling I can do better and I can level up and do I trust this tool where I can go there with it? And that can be in a good enough situation where if, if a, um, like my general interest to continue to grow in practice, I may just tolerate a tool. But then if, if I, if I, if I really want to dig, so for instance, uh, Clip Studio Paint is a fantastic example of, um, it offers so much more. It's like, I use it to only, you know, like 20% of its capabilities and I know I could go further, but then I, I can go further. I trust the tool. I love it. And it's awesome. I happen to use it in subscription mode, mode on the iPad. And so there's a little bit of that friction there where I'm like, is there's so many tools that get me close and are even better in certain scenarios where Clip Studio Paint doesn't do the thing that Procreate can do, which is to record a summary video of your drawing. And that is a killer feature. That is really cool. It's useful for so many things. Anyway, so like there's this there. And so I have this, this choice of like, how much do I need or want? to level up and how much do I trust the tool? Mm -hmm. And so I guess the third option would be, do I just have a scenario for that, this tool and that tool where I don't fully leave it behind. And so that's where I might end up. Yeah. The trust thing is, is a big one that I I'm glad you named it because I hadn't, I hadn't considered it that way, but like the, so you bring up Clip Studio Paint being a subscription model on iOS. And the moment they did that, I started going, I started backing away a little bit going like, okay, what other options are out there just in case? What should I start to learn just in case? Because I don't know how comfortable. Now, when it comes to it, I use the app literally every day. Uh, I use it for all my comics making in some form or another. Even if I were to draw on paper, I'd still be using it to do other aspects of comics creation. So I have the justification to afford a $10 a month if they switch to that across the board. But one of the ways they won my trust was when they said, oh, you bought a license? Here's the Mac and PC license. Here you go. You get both. What? I get both? Adobe always makes you just get one or the other. You know, like, well, we give you both. And if you want to put it on more than one machine, we're fine with that. What? Adobe gets really mad at me when I do that. <laughs> like, nope, nope, we're, we're fine with that. So, like, they won so much of my trust with those little things. And then that in... Um, uh, conjunction with all the affordances it does. Where it's like, oh, you have trouble drawing in perspective? Here, here's perspective tools. Oh, paneling, laying out panels is kind of a drag. Well, here, here, use this. It's really easy. Um, so yes, that that won a lot of my trust really fast. But they infringed on that trust just the littlest bit when they were like, oh, this is going to be a prescription or a subscription model from now on on iPad. I'm like, ugh, okay. Um, yeah. So like, how how much do you trust? the service um that you're signing on for with it right Mm -hmm. um the the business has a lot to do with i i think some of the tone of the trust where um just it's it's fine and natural businesses need to grow and change and but yet being being a um being a customer it it can feel not great when when something changes in where you didn't expect it or um or it goes in a direction that you'd prefer it didn't go in and mm-hmm. so that's one of the i think one of the easiest ways where actual actual trust gets um you know 
broken potentially, or, or at least messed up a little bit smudged. Mm -hmm. And then the other kind of trust is the, is the trustiness of like, this is a trusty tool. This mm -hmm. is, this is so, this gets me to this, the, the outcomes and the solutions I, I, I want. And, and we, we've gone on so many ad adventures. Well, you know, yeah. Yeah. this trusty tool is, is by my side. So that's yeah. another angle. And then another another angle for me is um, uh, it's the context of how do I like to work. So I, I think that this is worth examining for yourself as a artist is what kind of environments do you like to work in? Um, how much like like Anne really enjoys organizing her space. Like I really don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy it to the point where like I have to wait, like I won't do it until like I'm encroaching on her spaces. And she's like, come on, dude, please. And I'm like, oh yeah, I guess you're right. You know? Um, but so like there's, and this came, uh, this came up recently when we got a couple of new rapidograph pens, which I used to love so much. Um, and it's just, it's a mechanical pen. It's got, well, I've seen, if you haven't seen these before, it's got a little inkwell here in the back that you can fill with India ink. This actually comes off. I'm not going to take it off because that ink in there right now. Um, and then there's this little metal agitator inside that for, that pushes the ink into the tip and it creates these really crisp, very razor sharp fixed width lines. I used to use it for all my background work in my early comics work. Um, the front rebirth was the backgrounds are all inked with these. And I loved them. And part of the reason I loved them, and I remember talking about this in the Art and Story podcast too, is you have to clean them regularly or the ink will dry up and it will render the pen useless. And they're very expensive pens. I don't know, they're like 25 bucks, 30 bucks for a pen, you know? Mm -hmm. um, even if you just want to replace the tip, like this part right here, um, I don't know, this would be like 17 to $20. And that was, last time I looked was like 10 years ago. So it's probably more. So it's it's really upon you to like treat them well. And like Mark Rudolph and I used to talk about how like, oh, it was just like uh, checking in once a month on your tools and like buffing it and polishing it and really babying it. And you just it feels so great to like like really fuss over your tools that way. And now after being like working more mobily and wanting more like like um, uh, scrappy tools that are cheap and durable, when I started playing with this again, I was like, God, this is really asking a lot of me. This is really saying like, hey, you know, it's like really high maintenance. It's like, you know, attend me. I'm your pen. I'm like, yeah, you're supposed to draw. Yeah, but first you have to do all this stuff to me to draw. I'm like, no, I'm not going to sweet talk you all that much and like, you know, like romance you and woo you so I can get a line. Like, just let's just draw together, man. We're partners. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and and when we were, I was showing her how to like how I used them, she was like, you enjoyed that? I'm like, yeah, I don't anymore. <laughs> So, but, but it, there was a time where I really enjoyed that, 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 uh, I don't know, there's something meditative about pulling it all apart and getting all the cleaning materials together and just like slowly, like with a Q-tip swabbing it out and everything. Something about it was really appealing. So, but, uh, not anymore. Now the context is different. I like to work in a more mobile fashion. I don't want to have to check in on my tools and keep them up, like working really well. Um, I want something that's more durable and, 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 and sturdy and trusty in that way. Um, so. Hmm. Yeah, that's funny. It's a trust, trusty tools. Uh, the, yeah, what, what fits in that category can totally change. Um, I mean, and, and it's, I, I do think it's the idea. I don't think it's just us looking for novelty, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's just your presence in the environment and, you know, new solutions can come about if you, you know, if you, if you pay attention to them. Um, mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now they, it, it, it totally makes a, a circumstance contrast of like, well, um, yeah, it, it's, and, and I don't know, that's, that's just so interesting that, uh, uh, the, tr the tools that didn't change at all actually totally are, are adopted or, or set aside. Yep. You know, they, they, they didn't change and they were in this great category. Ah, there we go. Yeah. All right. Did we do a podcast? I think we did. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rob, for the discussion once again. Uh, another drill down on the topic and uh, thanks everybody for downloading, watching and listening. We, we stream the show live every Thursday at noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central and we stream it on twitch.tv slash lean into art. 
Twitch is it twitch.tv slash lean into art. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, we collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash lean into art and lean into art.com. We'll be back soon with another episode. We might have to do a rebroadcast next week because we're going to both be at CXC. So, but we'll be doing, we'll be posting stuff to the discord and maybe doing some audio and video to share with everybody through that um, or through Patreon, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, but in the meantime, I have been Jersey Drozd of LeanIntoArt.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of LeanIntoArt.com and I'm Rob Stenzinger on Instagram and also RobCoach.me. <laughs> okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at LeanIntoArt.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user LeanIntoArt. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.